We have a huge oral argument in Miller versus Bonta. The Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals is going to hear the challenge to the California quote-unquote assault weapon ban next week. And we're going to break down the major arguments by the parties. And then we're going to talk about the judges. Today, we're going to talk about the arguments made by the pro-Second Amendment briefs arguing in favor of the Second Amendment and against the assault weapon ban, claiming that the assault weapon ban violates the Supreme Court's decision of Heller, Bruin, and the Second Amendment itself. Stay tuned. Hey, folks, I'm Mark Smith, host of The Four Boxes, Diner, proud American gun owner, constitutional attorney, member of the United States Supreme Court Bar, and I'm proud to say a finalist, a top five finalist in two separate categories for the 2024 Gundy's Awards for top Second Amendment and gun-related YouTubers. First category is top male influencer in the United States when it comes to the Second Amendment, and the second category is top voices of the Second Amendment. Let's find out what happens in Las Vegas coming up soon. We'll see how that goes. I appreciate your support. All right, folks, major breaking news. We know what's going on. Major argument in the Ninth Circuit coming up in the next several days. I want to break down some of these big arguments. First of all, as you recall, this is the case called Miller versus Bonta. Miller versus Bonta was a challenge that arose out of Judge Benitez's uh, courtroom in California. Uh, Judge Benitez found that the quote-unquote assault weapon ban, which was essentially just a ban on semi-automatic rifles, was unconstitutional under the Second Amendment for various reasons, including but not limited to the fact that these guns were ubiquitous and thus in common use and cannot be banned under the precedent of Heller and Bruin, which of course Bruin simply is is a reiteration and expansion of Heller, but they're essentially the same methodology and approach to interpret and apply in the Second Amendment. But keep in mind that Heller actually already figured out how one interprets the Second Amendment and applies it when it comes to arms ban cases, because the Heller case was an arms ban case, concluding that the District of Columbia's handgun ban was unconstitutional under the Second Amendment because the handguns in the United States back in 2008, were in common use by Americans for lawful purposes. In fact, they were overwhelmingly the most popular firearm in the United States, and thus they were in common use and could not be banned. That is the test we are applying today, or should be applied today in Miller versus Bonta, is whether or not uh, ordinary semi-automatic rifles um, are, in fact, in common use by Americans for lawful purposes. They undeniably are. That is exactly why the anti-gunners want to ban them, because they claim there are too many of these. They're too popular, and we know, based on just uh, a week or so ago, the data out of the National Shooting Sports Foundation, which is relying upon industry data as well as government data, there's something along the order of magnitude of 29 or some odd million, 28, 29 million AR-15-style firearms, modern sporting rifles, if you will, all across the United States, and that number is growing by leaps and bounds, as well you know it would, because people really want their guns, and people are losing more and more trust in the government to protect them, because we know you are your own first responder. Uh, That is just the reality on the ground. So let us turn to the Second Amendment arguments being advanced by the uh, plaintiffs in this case, which includes, among others, the Second Amendment Foundation and the Firearms Policy Coalition, among the other plaintiffs. Uh, Specifically, I think they have a very... I'll put a link to the brief down below. You can check it out for yourself. I think the introduction is extremely powerful on behalf of the Second Amendment. Here Here are the lawyers on behalf of the Second Amendment Foundation, the Firearms Policy Coalition, and the rest of the plaintiffs state, essentially, that under the Supreme Court's decision on NYSERPR, versus Bruin, the plaintiffs must prevail in their challenge to California's bans on commonly possessed semi-automatic firearms. Bruin unequivocally reaffirms what the District of Columbia versus Heller teaches, that arms that are in common use for lawful purposes are protected and their possession and use cannot be banned full stop. The district court correctly held that the arms banned under the challenge provisions are in common use today for lawful purposes. That alone is dispositive of this case. But even considering the varied analogs proposed by the state to support its ban, the historical record demonstrates that California's ban on common rifles, handguns, and shotguns is an extreme historical outlier compared to any historical law restricting in some way the possession or carriage of weapons. Indeed, it is utterly unlike any historical law in the way it establishes a blanket ban on a category of firearms of the state's own creation, despite the fact that those firearms are among the most popular in the country. Not only is there no similar law from the founding, the most important time period for assessing the scope of the Second Amendment's protection, there is no similar law from any time before the 20th century. The district courts, which is referring to Judge Benitez's decision, permanently enjoining enforcement of the law should be affirmed.
Very powerful language, and it should be a winning argument. This brief goes on and makes a lot of powerful arguments. Specifically, they start off where we've talked about before in arms ban cases. What exactly is an arm? This is not very hard, and the definition given to us by the United States Supreme Court using 18th century definitions is very favorable. Keep in mind the text. The text of the Second Amendment reads, The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Well, what exactly is an arm and arms? Well, the Supreme Court in Hiller told us it's anything that can be used offensively or defensively is an arm. Specifically, the Supreme Court says that an arm is anything that is considered a weapon of offense or things that a man taketh into his hands or useth in wrath to cast at or strike another. Obviously, a semi-automatic firearm, including a semi-automatic rifle, is a weapon that can be used offensively or defensively, and thus it is an arm. Keep in mind that the definition of arms, as used by the Supreme Court in Heller, are definitions that were used in the 18th century when the 1791 Second Amendment was adopted. They used definitions from, for example, uh, Noah Webster, the first American lexicographer, a lexicographer, someone that designs and writes dictionaries. They also used Samuel Johnson's dictionary. Samuel Johnson was an English lexicographer, and of course, he defines arms the same way that Noah Webster did. As a side note, it was Noah Webster that did not want there to be an English-English dictionary. He thought there should be an American English dictionary and thus wrote the first American dictionary. So Noah Webster was a patriot and Samuel Johnson was a Tory. Just a little bit of side note there, but they both agreed that the definition of arms in the 18th century when the 1791 Second Amendment was adopted means anything that can be used offensively or defensively by a person. And what's even more amazing, according to this brief, it says that the state of California has literally conceded, they have conceded in their brief, that semi-automatic rifles, pistols, and shotguns generally constitute weapons of offense. So the state has conceded that these AR-15s and these semi-automatic rifles that are banned under California law are indeed arms, which means that the text of the Second Amendment, the right of the people to keep and bear arms, is implicated. So what happens next? Well, this Heller case teaches us what happens next, which you're dealing with a ban on the category of arms, which a ban on, a, on, a, on semi-automatic rifles is indeed a ban on a category of arms. We know what happens because Heller already decided it, because it ruled that a ban on a category of arms, where those arms are in common use by Americans for lawful purposes, such as handguns and Heller, semi-automatic rifles today in the 21st century, you cannot ban them because as Heller teaches, we the people have the right to determine what arms we own and what arms are in common use because we get to pick them because it is we the people that gets to choose. The government doesn't get to tell us what guns to use or what guns we can have. That's what Heller teaches when the District of Columbia in the Heller case said, hey, we can ban handguns in the District of Columbia. Why? Because we're letting people who live in D.C. have rifles and long guns. And ironically, the District of Columbia in 2008 argued that rifles and long guns were better for self-defense and better for Americans and anyway than handguns, which was the preferred choice of weapon for criminals. But of course, the Supreme Court in Heller says, you guys are totally off base. The reality is, you, D.C., we, the government, don't get to decide what guns Americans want. They get to have any of these guns, and just because you let them have rifles and shotguns doesn't mean that you can ban them from having handguns. Now, what, of course, is ironic here is today in the 21st century, because of the Heller precedent, the anti-gun lobby has shifted gears entirely and gone from handguns bad, rifles, long guns good, which is the argument in 2008, to what they argue today, which is handguns are good, handguns are great for self-defense, and rifles are bad for self-defense. That's why we, the government, can ban AR-15s. See how that game gets played. I write all about this in my book. First, they came for the gun owners. You may want to check that out. It's a few years old now, but it still lays out all the different tactics of the left and of the anti-gunners in the United States. You may want to check that one out. So then the Second Amendment argument goes on like this. This is what they argue in the brief. They rely on a Ninth Circuit, that's right, a Ninth Circuit decision that concluded that a Hawaii ban on butterfly knives is unconstitutional under the Second Amendment. Remember how I teach you that brick, brick, brick 
I mean, precedent, precedent, precedent. We want all these different cases, even if they deal with butterfly knives or the Caetano case that deals with stun guns or the Heller case that deals with handguns or whatever it is. We want all these individual cases in our favor, even if it may seem like a small deal, it actually turns out to be a big deal because other courts can rely on those earlier earlier cases for precedence. And that's what's going on here. So here you have a case where in Teeter, the Ninth Circuit ruled, uh, I don't know, about six or seven months ago, I believe, that butterfly knives, not exactly the hottest topic in America, but the butterfly knives and the fact they were banned in Hawaii because they were you know, commonly used in America and uh, in common use by Americans for lawful purposes, the Hawaii ban on butterfly knives was unconstitutional under the Second Amendment. And lo and behold, that butterfly knife precedent has now reappeared in this case dealing with semi-automatic rifles because now the Second Amendment plaintiffs are relying upon and citing to the court the Teeter case dealing with butterfly knives. And here is what the brief says. It's very powerful language. It says, Teeter also held that if a weapon is commonly possessed by law-abiding citizens for lawful purposes, it cannot be dangerous and unusual. Obviously, we've talked a lot about this on our channel, that the standard, the only conceivable way, the only conceivable theoretical way that an arm can be banned in the United States is if it is dangerous and unusual. And here's the reality of it. The weapons that we're fighting about today, AR-15s, AK-47s, uh, you know, semi-automatic rifles of all, over, all types, uh, semi-automatic handguns, which of course are protected by Heller, and magazines that hold more than 10 rounds, and so on and so on and so on, these are all in common use by millions, if not tens of millions of Americans. So we easily win under any conceivable standard, including this dangerous and unusual standard. Some people complain about it, but the reality is it is a completely winning standard. It should be if you have courts that are honest enough to apply the Supreme Court precedent, as I lay out in my article in the Harbor Journal of Law and Public Policy, an article I talk about in common use. As a side note, I should in indicate that the Second Amendment Foundation and the Firearms Policy Coalition in their brief here do indeed quote and rely upon two very powerful pieces of scholarship by an extremely handsome YouTuber with actual real hair by the name of Mark Smith. You may have heard about him, and I'm proud to say that they have relied upon and cited to two of my articles, one dealing with in common use, which is clearly the test under Heller for arms ban cases. You don't need to redo the work. That's not how the game gets played, you judges out there that are on the left. And the other thing, of course, is the relevant time period for understanding and interpreting the Second Amendment is 1791, when it was written. And this is also a very powerful argument that's made in this brief as well. Another powerful argument that the Second Amendment plaintiffs make in this case, in the Miller case, is they really try to point out, now we've talked about this quite a bit on this channel before. This is very important to understand, so I want you to pause and reflect on it. The Bruin test, which again is the Heller Bruin test, says you start with the text of the Second Amendment. If a modern day gun control law is implicated or implicates the text of the Second Amendment, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. The burden shifts to the government. The burden shifts to the government to show that the law is constitutional as a matter of historical analog laws, actual laws on the book. And the presumption is once the text is implicated by the modern day gun control law, that the law, the modern day gun control law, is unconstitutional. That is the presumption. It's like you're presumed innocent in a court of law in a criminal case. So too, when the text of the Second Amendment is implicated by modern day gun control law, the presumption is that modern day gun control law is unconstitutional and should be struck down and unenforceable. Now, the only way that the government can get around this is to show there are long standing, going back to the time of the founding laws, that are analogous to the modern day gun control law to show that indeed uh, that law was, is constitutional as a matter of how the founding fathers would envision the modern day gun control law. If the founding fathers would think the modern day gun control law you know, went too far or was unconstitutional, it would be viewed as unconstitutional essentially by virtue of the historical record. Now what's interesting, I've talked about this before, is, and this is very important to understand this one point, the anti-gun movement is desperate, desperate, desperate to elevate every single Second Amendment controversy to the textual level, okay? They want to argue that, for example, that the in common use test, which is the in common use by Americans for lawful purposes test, that that is actually part of the text of the Second Amendment. But that's not true. The reason, though, you got to understand this, is why the anti-gun movement wants to elevate all these fights about the Second Amendment to the textual level is because the textual level, the burden has not yet shifted to the government. 
The government never, ever, ever wants the burden to shift to it because it knows that if it has to rely upon 1791 historical analog gun control laws, there's extremely few of them, and odds are they're going to lose virtually every single case. That's why the government wants to elevate these controversies to the textual level where the burden has not yet shifted to the government. And that's exactly what, as I predicted repeatedly on this channel, and if you watch this channel, you, you know you're the smartest person in the room because you know this before anybody else even picks up on it. That is exactly what is being argued in this case of Miller before the Ninth Circuit. Specifically, the Second Amendment plaintiffs argue that the state is playing exactly this game. Here is what the brief says. The state of California in particular disputes the idea that these arms are in common use, arguing that deciding that issue requires more than just asking whether they are owned in large numbers. The state would place the burden on plaintiffs to prove that the features it has banned are in fact helpful to someone defending themselves. This gets the analysis backward. That is, again, the historical test. And the burden is on the state to prove the banned firearms are not in common use, as this court, the Ninth Circuit, has recently explained in Teeter versus Lopez. Further, what the state needs to disprove is not that the banned firearms are commonly used for self-defense specifically, but rather that they are commonly possessed for lawful purposes generally. And on that front, there can be no question regarding the banned firearms. So again, it's simply going to be impossible, as I see it, if the laws apply correctly. Now, that's a big question we'll talk about in a future video before the Miller argument or after the Miller argument. Um, if it's applied correctly, this is a no-brainer case, a clear win for the Second Amendment. But again, it's the Ninth Circuit, and we'll see what happens there. So anyway, the bottom line is, uh, this is a very powerful brief. They make a lot of other arguments. They also argue in the alternative that the state's trying to rely on other historical analog laws that they don't need to even get into because Heller's really decided the issue. They talk about how the state's trying to say that there are Bowie knives uh, regulations uh, in the early 19th century. But as you know, Bowie knives or Bowie knives were never banned in any place. They were simply regulated. There were certain restrictions on whether or not you could carry Bowie knives, either uh, open or concealed. But again, that has nothing to do with what's going on in California with these AR-15s, which is an actual ban. As you know, the, the, the way we've taught about this, or we talked about this, that the way a historical analog law, for it to even get into the basket of laws that can be considered by a court in a given modern fight over a modern-day gun control law, the how of the law and the why of the law have to line up. So even if you want to assume for the sake of argument that the why they restricted Bowie knives and the why they restricted AR-15s is the same. The hows don't line up. And why is that? Because the how the law was enforced with Bowie knives was you were prevented from concealed carrying them, whereby here, the modern gun control law dealing with AR-15s in California and semi-automatic firearms in California is the how is not the same because the how they deal with the problem in the 21st century is they ban them, you can't even possess them, whereas the how of the Bowie knives is that you could not carry them concealed. Do you see how the how the laws were enforced were different? One was an absolute ban in the modern 21st century. The other is you cannot carry it concealed. So the how and the why of the Bowie knives analog laws don't line up to justify and support that the modern day bans on these semi-automatic rifles are constitutional. All right, folks. Well, there you have it. A quick summary of the Second Amendment brief in the Miller versus Bonta case dealing with California's assault weapon ban. Uh, we will cover more of this. We're going to talk about what California argues next. And again, hope you've learned something. If you haven't subscribed, please subscribe. And keep in mind, a lot of people are getting unsubscribed to this channel. So please, please keep subscribing and subscribing because I keep hearing notices and people keep telling me they're getting unsubscribed to this channel for some reason. Don't know why that's happening. Anyway, please make sure you do that. Don't forget to follow me on X at 4 Boxes Diner. And we will see you again soon here at the 4 Boxes Diner. Orders up. Table 2A.